Divine Truths Frequently Asked Question Session. Jesus, Mary and others provide answers to questions that are frequently asked by members of the media and public. This presentation is part of the Partner Relationship Series. Jesus and Mary answer questions about bad habits that ruin good relationships. This session was recorded on the 27th of October 2015 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session 4, part 1. Hi everyone. Welcome to session 4 of my discussion with Jesus on partner relationships. Should be a good session today. Should be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because at the last session we dealt with a lot of the things that, uh, well, the four primary qualities that a person's going to need to develop a good relationship. Yeah. And this session we're going to concentrate a lot more on the, the, uh, the bad habits that people have. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the way you've described this one. This the the bad habits to get rid of if you want to have a good relationship. Mm. Yeah. So the ba bad habits that ruin good relationships yeah. is probably what we'll title this one. Yeah. <laughs> what I like it about reminds me of that song, eh? Can't help myself, bad habits, <laughs> keep running wild, lost control. <laughs> and you know what I reckon the major problem is in that most relationships people say, I can't help myself. Exactly. When in fact we can. Yes, and, and, I, and I suppose this relates to the underlying thing that we introduced in our last uh, session on, uh, last frequently asked question on these topics, and that, and that was the concept that we can individually be perfect and our relationship can be perfect. Yeah. And I feel that we need to always have that focus in our relationship, that it's possible to have our relationship and, our, and as a person individually, that it's possible to be perfect. And we need to have that goal, that underlying goal. I feel that most people are pretty disillusioned with that concept. They are. And so they don't have that underlying goal. And they deny the use of their will then. It, they justify not embracing a will to actually challenge the things that we're going to talk about in this session. Yes. So what, what we end up happening, what end up, ends up happening is relationships become more of a codependent bartering system rather than a true love-based gift, gifting of love towards each other that binds both of you together. And I also notice a lot that uh, we, and by the way, I suppose you could say in this introduction that we still haven't got to seeing practically how we can ask the first questions we introduced in the first session. Yeah. So what, what we're trying to do is basically establish the foundation of what will make a good relationship continue to grow. And then we'll get to some real practical issues about how each of these things that we've raised will, will, can be answered in specific questions that people have asked about their personal relationships. Yeah, what I like about this series of FAQs that we've been doing so far is that we are giving people the, the building blocks, as you said, we've got the, the two primary questions, the, uh, sorry? Yep. Yes, the four <laughs> supplemental questions. Yes. And uh, then we talked about the four issues, love, truth, humility and will. Yes. And now today we're going to talk about a very distinct set of bad habits, as you call them. Yes. Um, and anybody will recognise them from our discussions about emotion. Yep. So, you know, a lot, of our, a lot of the discussions about emotion will relate to partner relationships, of course. Yeah. So they'll start to see how they affect or how they impact upon a relationship yep. and in this case the bad habits that can ruin the relationship <laughs> and and ruin good relationships so we often yep. notice people who start out having had the potential to have quite a good relationship and yet the reality is that the bad habits kick in mm -hmm. and as soon as they kick in it, it definitely rapidly generally destroys a relationship and, and then it's a matter of tolerance about whether a person's going to tolerate uh, this terrible relationship they're now in for the rest of their life or whether they're going to finish up making a decision that no, they, can, they, they will risk leaving that relationship and starting another one. Yeah. The unfortunate thing though with starting another relationship is the bad habits follow them. Exactly. And, <laughs> and so you end up with the bad habits that impacted upon the previous relationship now impacting upon the new relationship and the new relationship often turning out, um, you know, to be as bad as the old one or not much improved version of the old one. Or it could be almost the bad habits switch over completely. We, we used a certain number of bad habits with one person and we promised to ourselves we would never do that again. Yeah. And instead we then introduce a whole 
series of other bad habits to, to satisfy our addictions or facade. Yeah. And, and, and then we impact, we, we impose those bad habits upon the next relationship. And that often happens where a person has what they believe to be a really bad relationship and then they impose a whole heap of bad habits they you know grow a whole heap of new bad habits <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really <laughs> to avoid <laughs> to the... avoid the pain of that old yep. relationship and then they impose that those bad habits on the new relationship and uh, that's very very sad to mm. see that happening where people often then have two or three relationships and then they decide not to have another one or they decide to that what they've got right now is the best it can possibly be and they stay satisfied with that yeah I like the way you're discussing the person's personal bad habits. What I notice is that most people, including myself in the past, we focus on the partner's bad habits r rather than recognising we have a corresponding set of bad habits that are even enabling and in this codependency mm -hmm. where we're bouncing off each other with what are, from God's perspective, very bad habits. Yes. And that's one of the things that we talked about in humility is having the humility to actually look at ourselves in this dynamic mm -hmm. rather than continually projecting blame yes. outwards. But also in this introduction, I think I'd like to introduce the concept that uh, many of our bad habits are quite evil in their nature mm -hmm. and intention. Um, I feel a lot of people believe that they uh, are relatively innocent of evil. but The reality is our bad habits create a lot of evil in our life and actually do come from some quite damaged and often quite evil underlying intentions within ourselves. And from God's perspective, you can see why when people enter relationships, why quite a lot generally of damage is done mm -hmm. in a relationship to the person's soul and the soul of other people. Yeah. Because you're now engaged full time, if you like, with another person's so, uh, heart, you know, another half of a soul. Yep. And as a result of that, you now have the potential full time to hurt somebody. And then, of course, if children come into the relationship, you now have the potential not only to full time hurt your partner, but also to full time impose all of your bad habits upon your children as well. So you can see why a lot of people pass in a poor condition because they're imposing these bad habits, justifying them to themselves, yeah. but also imposing them not only upon their partner, but also on their children. And, and their partner at least would have a choice to leave, but the children don't even have that choice. Yeah. So we're actually forcing our children to have these bad habits imposed upon them. So there is a significant amount of potential damage that a relationship can do if we are out of harmony with love. But there is a significant amount of joy and happiness that can be achieved if the relationship is inside of harmony with love. Yeah. And that's probably what we'd like to talk about at a, a, later, a later session as well. Yeah. But at this stage, we want to raise this issue of <laughs> what, are, what are these bad habits that ruin relationships? And the majority of people have heard our, us talk about, you know, emotions will recognise most of these bad habits at some point. What I like is that we're going to talk about these bad habits in, and specifically hone in on the relationship aspect though, isn't it? We've mm. spoken a lot generally about how it affects people generally in their day-to-day -day lives and their soul condition, but now we have the opportunity to really apply these principles to a partner relationship and hopefully give some people in, even insight into why things aren't working well in their partner relationships and what they're not wanting to see in terms of bad habits. Yes. Yeah. So let's get into it. Good. <laughs> How does denial ruin my relationship? <laughs> well, with all of these questions, where I think we've first got to ask ourselves, what's the purpose of denial? Mm -hmm. And then we would then be able to see how it's probably going to ruin a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, is the, what are the reasons why we use denial? Now, here that we could say there's denial of a number of things. There's firstly denial of truth. Mm -hmm. Why do we use denial of truth? Then there's denial of emotion. Why do we use denial of emotion? And what, what is it that causes us to want denial? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think that's where we need to start with this particular question. Yeah. Why do we want it? And then we'll look at what, it, what, what it does. terrible damage it does. Yeah. Mm. So if we look at denial of God's truth, what impact does that have on our relationship? Well, the reason, if we say why we want 
God, uh, to deny God's truth first. Yep. Um, truth has the effect of of opening up the soul. Mm -hmm. It has the effect also, though, potentially of causing us to see a lot of things that we can't see. And therefore, we might need to feel about them. Yeah. And then we might need to act upon them. Yeah. Now, the, what denial achieves is it, is it helps us deny our feeling about things. Mm -hmm. It helps us shut down the recognition of truth and how we feel about the truth. Yeah. It also helps us shut down emotion. If we deny that we have a certain thing happening, then we don't have to feel about it. Yeah. And then also, we, it, we have, it has the effect of, um, what was the third thing I mentioned? Which, um, About taking action. Taking action. Yeah, so, so what it does is it helps me avoid having to take some action in the relationship mm -hmm. in order to fix the particular problem. Yep. In other words, I can get to sit back and go, no, there's no problem here. And in saying there's no problem here, I get to not have to feel things that I need to feel. Mm -hmm. I get to not have to recognise things that I need to recognise. And I get to not have to do something about them. Yeah. So, so denial is a great way of avoiding a whole heap of things. Mm -hmm. That's what we think. That's right? what we think. That's yeah. what we think. That's yeah. why we use it. So we, we have this false idea, look, if I don't want to know the truth, I don't have to actually confront anything about myself or my partner. I don't have to feel, or, or my partner doesn't have to feel any painful emotion. Mm -hmm. And me or my partner doesn't have to take any action based on the recognition of truth Correct. in our relationship. Correct. So we think it's a good idea. But, but. It's, a, but it's a terrible idea. <laughs> it's a terrible idea for, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> so let's look at how it actually ruins our relationship sure. then. Because we think it's good, but in reality, it's not so good. Yes. So we've listed some things down here. Yeah. When we deny the truth, we essentially can't change to become more loving or truthful. So that's a big problem. It is. So if you're already not very loving and your relationship's not very happy, and already it's got problems, but denying things is only going to make it worse, mm -hmm. not better. Yep. <laughs> like we need to, we need to see that. Like we yep. need to come to to understand that denial of a problem doesn't make the problem go away. All it does, and particularly with the way God's laws work, all it does is grow the problem actually, yep. because yep. God's laws are trying to expose the problem to you. Yep. God's laws are like hitting you with a initially with a feather and then eventually with a hammer and then <laughs> <laughs> with a brick and then with a truck, you know, yep. Yep. trying to expose to you what the problem is, right? Yep. So your life becomes more and more and more and more painful. Yep. Your relationship becomes more and more and more painful every time you deny something. So you're far better off accepting the truth about something than denying it. Yeah. Yeah. Far better. Yeah. I often think about relationships and people in relationships and it's like you you already know, that, say, there's issues. You you know the boat's a bit leaky that yeah. you're sailing in. Yeah. And you, you're trying to do all these things to bucket out the, out the water. And dealing with the effects. Dealing with the effects. Mm. When, you, when you go into denial and a few of the other things that we've talked about it's like you actually like cut a gaping hole in the bottom of the boat and it's just going to sink <laughs> that's Is what it? most people believe you well mean. no i mean when you actually deny things they think oh, they're plugging course, a hole yes. but when you deny things you actually, you actually increase, increase the hole, the hole yeah. and you're going to sink much more rapidly yeah and the chances of the relationship breaking up are much greater than if you actually had a look at the truth and work through the issues yeah and, and facing the truth actually is the beginning of putting a plug in the hole and Correct. stopping you having to keep bucketing. And also stopping you out. having to keep dealing with the effects all the time. Yes. The effects are, you know, the, a lot of people's relationships, instead of having this nice, joyful, creative process in their relationship, they're always just dealing with the outcomes of their poor decisions. Yeah. And, uh, and now obviously that is never going to work either. Eventually the boat sinks under those conditions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, also, when we deny truth, we prevent my, ourselves having a relationship with God. So me or my partner having a relationship with God. Yes, because God has a, everything in God's universe and all of God's laws are based around truth. So, so if we try to deny truth, we are immediately preventing a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And the way God's created the human soul, you are also immediately preventing a, rela a proper relationship with your partner. Yeah. So, so whether you or your partner deny truth, you're going to prevent your relationship from further growth. 
And you're also going to prevent intimacy, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, the more, the more you're in denial, the more less intimate your relationship will become. Yeah, there's no truth that opens a soul or draws you closer together. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, we also, both of us, get to prevent our experience of painful emotion. Yes, and, and we've talked a lot in the emotional section about how it's only the release of painful emotions that causes your behaviour to change. So, so if you're in denial of the emotional experience, you prevent the emotional experience from occurring, then there is no chance of your half of the soul changing mm. and therefore there is no chance of the relationship improving between yourself and your partner. Mm. Now, if your partner and you both do it, then obviously <laughs> there's going to be a huge amount of problems in the relationship. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And following on from that, that you've already mentioned, that when we deny truth, say we're the partners, both of us, we both get to avoid taking action. Yes. And that's a big issue. Yeah. I see a lot of people want to avoid taking action. Sometimes the action might mean that they have to separate for a while to work through their issues. Sometimes the action might be going to some kind of therapist to help them work through their issues. Sometimes the action might be that they need to actually go and experience some emotions privately. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the action might mean that they need to break up, mm -hmm. you know, depending on how bad the situation is and recognition of truth causes you to see that you need to break up. And that has a whole heap of other financial and other problems associated yeah. with it and emotional issues associated with it. So most people love to avoid taking action unless they're forced into doing it. Yeah. Now that's unfortunate in a relationship. If, a, if you want a relationship that grows, you need to take action all the time to make it grow yeah. rather than trying to avoid taking action. Yeah. And denial helps you avoid taking action. Yeah, it yeah. does. So not a very good tool <laughs> for, for the growth of your relationship. <laughs> okay, so let's go through these in a bit more detail. Mm -hmm. When I deny emotion in my relationship, I and my partner cannot take responsibility for emotions that we choose to deny. Mm. So, so part, of, part of emotional, part of your self-responsibility that God's trying to teach you is that you need to take responsibility for how you feel mm -hmm. and not expect other people to take responsibility for how you feel. Yeah. Now, whenever I'm in denial, I'm expecting my environment to take on how I'm feeling and, and I remain unconscious or, mm -hmm. or semi-conscious mm -hmm. about how I'm feeling and I'm expecting my, my environment to take up the slack and to actually deal with the projections of how I'm feeling onto them. That's a very unloving thing to do to so, the environment. So, yeah, and when you're speaking about an environment in the context of a relationship, very often we're asking our partner to take up the slack of our denied emotions, aren't we? All the time, generally. Yeah. Yeah. So anything that we don't want to feel, we want our partner's help to avoid feeling. Yeah. And anything our partner doesn't want to feel, generally they want our help to avoid their feeling of that particular thing. Yeah. And, and this sets up as, so the, the denial is what starts the process. If I didn't deny the truth and didn't deny my emotion, then obviously I wouldn't do those things to my partner and I wouldn't allow my partner to do those things to me either. Yeah. Or to themselves, <laughs> or to myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, you, you, the first, the the four supplemental questions always mm -hmm. kick in when with regard to all of these factors. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So change is going to require that both me and my partner deal with essentially the addictions that you're talking about there and experience our painful emotions. Yes, but addictions are another subject altogether. I feel this is all about the denial of my emotion, mm -hmm. not dealing with my addictions. Mm -hmm. That's another subject I feel. Here what we're trying to do is help people get to the point of just looking at their denial, yep. like the feeling in them that they want to avoid the truth about a lot of things and they want to avoid the emotional truth about a lot of things. Yep. So, so for example, when their husband looks at another woman, they want to avoid the emotional truth of how that makes them feel. They want to avoid the emotional truth about what it means from his perspective inside of his heart that he actually is interested in other women and might take the opportunity to 
to take the whole thing further if given the circumstances and how does that make you feel mm. you want to avoid a whole heap of feelings and that's why you deny it's even a problem so what do we do we'd say to ourselves in that place oh it doesn't matter where he gets his you know what's appetite. appetite as long as he comes home we're, you know we're fine that that is a method of denial minimizing the mm -hmm. thing is denying minimizing justifying or shifting the blame is all denial mm -hmm. it's all a way of you not getting to have to feel what you probably already feel or know is already within you yeah. but you're completely avoiding now the problem with the denial is as we've mentioned already it causes a huge amount of problems in the relationship and therefore growth is not possible mm -hmm. So basically what we're saying, in order to change in the relationship, both parties have to desire to become, to come out of this state of denial and to become more sensitive to the real emotions that are going on or the real dynamics that are going on. Yeah, I, I would call it awareness. They yep. need to get out of purposeful denial mm -hmm. and into a state firstly of intellectual awareness. Yep. But even once they get through that, there also is another stage where they have to go into some kind of emotional awareness of what's mm -hmm. really going on in order to, to repair any damage to their relationship and then build upon that repaired job, you know, to grow it to the point where it's perfect. Yep. And, and if, if they, they choose denial, that is not possible. Mm. 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 So we need to get out of denial and into the opposite of denial, which is awareness allow yourself to be aware and look at all of the emotional reasons in particular why you wish to deny something that's really happening in your relationship rather yeah. than fixing it yeah yeah okay so then let's extend that further when we deny god's truth so we're talking about denying their the emotions and the in, the truth of the interactions that are going on in our relationship mm -hmm. there's a further step that people who want to follow the way are going to want to apply mm -hmm. if they're going to be successful yeah. and that is to look at God's truth about these issues and so when we want to deny God's truth about the state of our relationship what kinds of things happen then well if we look at God's laws um, and see the reflection on God's truth we can see that if I deny God's truth and I'm also denying that for example deny, I'm denying the law of compensation mm -hmm. now the, what the law of compensation is is it's telling me that all of my personal pain is because i'm personally choosing to hold on to an unloving condition at yeah. some point yeah. so even personal pain that occurs in my relationship is the result of my choice to hold on to some unloving condition within myself and my partner's choice to hold on to some unloving condition within themselves but my personal sadness or pain is directly in proportion to my choice to hold on to my own unloving condition as it makes sense mm -hmm. now if i'm not respecting god's truth i will not see the power of that <coughs> the power of that is that i can i can um, feel that the main reason why i'm in pain is is because i'm choosing to do something that's unloving yep. and i also have the ability and responsibility to change that if I'm ever going to become more loving mm -hmm. as an individual and therefore more happy. Mm -hmm. So my ignorance of God's law, in this case of compensation, causes me to avoid God's truth on the matter and causes me to start to believe that my personal pain is caused by everybody else yeah. rather than me. Yeah. And, and then we have a tendency to blame our partner for our personal pain, yep. right? Which is even worse now, because now we're putting a huge fissure, mm -hmm. a huge break between us and our partner. And, and in doing so, we're actually completely disowning the personal responsibility that comes from the fact that all emotional pain that I have and all physical pain that I have is a complete result of me avoiding God's law of compensation when it comes to love. Yeah, and that's a, exactly what you what you just said there. The purpose of the law of compensation is is to bring us pain so that we know there's an injury within us. Correct. And many times in partner relationships it's so tempting to blame the other person for the personal pain. Correct. You did A, so I feel B. Yes, and that's not true. No. I feel B because of a whole lot of reasons which are usually have almost nothing to do 
yeah. with the person doing A, yeah. but rather a whole heap to do with all the unfelt and unhealed emotional things that happened during our childhood and our adolescence growing up and all of our unloving choices in relationships and all of our expectations and demands all happening. That's why I felt B <laughs> yes. from your action A. Yeah. You know, so your action A is just really a trigger. And even then it's not, you know, it wouldn't have triggered anything if I was in a state of love or at one moment with God. So, so yeah. why is it that I'm feeling all this pain? It's got to be something to do with myself. And that's what the law of compensation says. Denial helps me go, that doesn't happen. It's all somebody else's problem. That's what denial does. Well, denial, yeah, denial in, in two ways I see this happening with the law of compensation. One is to just deny that the pain is even there, even though you keep racking it up year after year. And feeling it, your body's showing you in the mirror as well. Yeah. You know, what's racking up as well. So we want to deny even that that's happening or that mm -hmm. pain is there. And the second way is to deny the, the cause of the pain is due to some error within ourselves. Yes, and I than... suppose this brings us to the denial of the of another law, which yes. is the law of cause and effect. Yes. So here we go, another law we're in denial of. We're saying we've got all these effects, like we've got pain in our relationship, pain in our body, our partner's got pain in their body, we're growing old, we're getting sick, and you know all sorts of things are happening in our relationship that cause the relationship stress. And then we're saying to ourselves, but all of that is caused by some mysterious thing that I've got no idea what it is. And so what I do is I go and take my pills and put on my lotions and do all the other things needed yeah. to improve my lot in life. When the real thing I need to do is understand what caused it, which was my holding on to an unloving condition within myself, yeah. to either towards myself or towards others. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's caused it. And if we're not willing to look at cause and effect, then we can't really within the relationship problem solve anything, can we? we yes. And it, and it gets even worse. If I deny cause and effect even exists, then I'm going to be totally focused on trying to fix the effects without understanding their causes, yeah. which is ludicrous when yeah. you think about it and a stupid action to take because the cause will keep happening and therefore cause the effect no matter what you do about it. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it, it's a really silly way to treat a relationship, but, but denial helps us be in that state yeah. where we go, no, I'm just going to deal with the effect, take my lotions and potions, mm -hmm. And hopefully things will improve and things never do. No. And, and, and eventually, you know, the relationship is going to break up. Even if you keep it the whole time on earth, it's going to break up sometime in your spirit state, world state after you've died. Yeah. And, and all the things you're avoiding are all going to come out anyway. Yeah. So it doesn't make much it point. Doesn't make There's sense. not much sense to do it whatsoever. And, and the way I see a lot of people um, remaining in denial about this law is that they often, they often attribute the effect as a cause almost or they or they attribute a different cause to the effect they don't want god's soul-based hmm. truth about the issue do they they want that they are oh, i've got sexual issues that's because of a physical issue within myself or, yeah or i've got cancer that's because you know i've got cancer and there's yeah. nobody really knows the reason yeah. why yeah. you know what i mean yeah. Yeah. and these are the kind of things that could all be helped in a relationship and in fact relationships often do cause a person to have quite significant illnesses when they act out of harmony with love, yeah. including things like cancer. Yeah. And, and if they could see the unloving behaviour and, and address it, then the cancer would disappear or the illness would disappear. Yeah. But, but of course, most people don't see it that way. They instead focus on the effect and they even go even further. And they, like in the case of cancer, they want the other party to look after them until they die, you know. Yeah which is a part of the reason why they got the cancer in the first place. And, yeah. and, and there's all sorts of uh, underlying issues mm -hmm. that, all are, that are all ignored by denying that yeah. they exist. Yeah. And I suppose the other thing that we're now talking about is how the law of attraction brings us things. So we're, we're in ignorance of that law too. Mm -hmm. we're, now, we're now saying, everything that happens to me has got nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. And God's saying, no, I'm sorry. Everything that happens to you has got a whole heap of things to do to you, about you. And, and the reality is, while everything that happens to you isn't necessarily you, because other people have free will and they can choose to do things to you without you being involved, the reality is we attract many of these events because of something we need to heal inside of ourselves. And when we're in denial, we get to also not believe that. <laughs> yes. And even if you think about relationships, Often the, the very partner we attract 
is part of that law trying to help us Correct. to to heal some issues or to see some truth about ourselves yes. and very often people wish to deny that 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 they had any part in attracting some of the injuries or the the issues of love in their partner yes so you quite often hear a man say why did i attract that bitch into my life you know <laughs> you know why do i keep getting these kind of women in my life well it's got a lot to do with you you're the center of the of what's <laughs> of the happening to you yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and the women may say why did i get that mongrel in my life you know that <laughs> bastard why is he in my life you know i just get rid of all these bastards and, blah, blah, blah. and the reality is well it's got a lot to do with you what you need to work your way through emotionally has got a lot to yeah. do with the attraction and if you stopped judging it so much you would probably have a, a, a lot better ch chance to not deny it so much. Yeah. But when yeah. we judge things a lot, we ha that supports our denial. Yeah. And we should probably point out that when we say, like, you're the centre of the attraction or you're the one who keeps attracting these things, it's not to say that unloving behaviour in either yourself or your partner is is deserved. No, not at all. It's... <clears throat> in fact, quite the opposite. Yeah. It's definitely not deserved. However... The question becomes, well, why am I attracting it yeah. and why is it causing me pain? Yeah. Has to do with something going on inside of me. Yeah. So, so while we do not believe somebody treating you badly is deserved, um, and even if you're a terrible, evil person, it's still not deserved. <laughs> right? when people need to treat you fairly and maybe restrict you if yeah. you're evil, but it's certainly not deserved that you get treated badly, even mm -hmm. if you're evil. God doesn't treat you badly, even when you're evil. However, God's laws do have an operation upon the soul. And the more evil you become, the more difficult your life is going to be. Yeah. And, uh, and the more, you know, less security and less safety you're going to have and so forth. And we need to see the relationship between our unloving choices and what's happening to us. Yeah. And, and also that God is lovingly trying to correct us and educate us. Mm -hmm. And while we're in denial of these, even these three basic, what I would call laws of natural love, even when we're in denial of those, we're basically saying to God, no, I don't want to be educated. Yeah. Right? So denial causes a lack of education. It's like a person in a third world country not being able to read and you go up to him and say, can you read? And he says, yes. Right? Which is what we often do. We say we've got no problems or when we have many and he, he would be saying that he's got, he's got no problem, he can read. Now, how is that going to affect the rest of his life? Well, quite intensely, actually. He's not going to be able to read for the rest of his life, probably, unless somebody teaches him or he teaches himself. Now, he's, if he's in denial that he's even got the problem, that's probably never going to happen. Yeah. 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 And it's exactly the same. So we, you're saying we prevent our own education through denial. Yes. And the final thing that we talked about with regards to denial and denial of God's truth is that within a relationship, if we deny the gift of free will that each, each party has, then we're very likely to disrespect the will of the mm -hmm. other person mm -hmm. uh, or to even submit to them manipulating our, our will. will. Mm. Yep. Uh, feeling that one person's will is more important or that we both must compromise and bend our will to the other mm -hmm. uh, without really looking at God's truth about the matter, which is that, well, there's so much involved in the, the gift yes, of free I, will, we, isn't we it? could talk for weeks about just yeah. the issue of will and how it's used in a relationship. But if we examine it just briefly, while I'm in denial of God's truth, there's a large likelihood that I'm also in denial of the gift of free will that God's given each party, each mm -hmm. half of, of the soul in the relationship. And, and while I deny that the other person or myself has free will, there was a lot of things I'll choose to do. I'll choose to deny my personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. I'll choose to deny your personal responsibility. I'll choose to take responsibility for things that are not my fault yeah. and or want you to take responsibility for things that are not your fault. Or I refuse to take responsibility for things that are not my fault, that are mm -hmm. my fault mm -hmm. and expect you mm -hmm. and, and allow you to do the same. And none of those things are going to ever have any positive effect on our relationship. No, yeah, mm. very important. Yes, so I suppose you could say in summary, yes. denial, bad habit, <laughs> very bad habit. <laughs> and, and we need to find the real emotional reasons why we do it. And we need to eradicate it from firstly ourselves, but also eventually eradicate it from the relationship itself. So both parties are 
never in a state of denial of what's going on in their relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Once we get to that point, we've got some hope to grow our good relationship. Mm -hmm. If we don't, we're going to ruin our good relationship. Yeah. So while both, or why, really while one or both parties are choosing denial, willfully wanting to remain ignorant about the true nature of the relationship and the implications of what's really going on in mm -hmm. the relationship, then the relationship is going to, as we said in our question, it's going to be ruined, basically. Yes. It's going, it does not have any life. It's either going to be a permanently bad relationship, mm -hmm. which we observe many, many couples have. Or it's going to completely disintegrate. Yeah. It can it can't be any different yeah. while both one or both parties in the relationship are choosing denial. Yeah. It just can't be any different. Yeah. Which is sad. It is sad. Mm. And um I'm now anticipating people out there viewing this video thinking about how they now need to force their partner out of denial, which is <laughs> Well in itself that's a denial. Forcing them to face truth, which is, as you said, a denial. Yeah, it's a denial of your own responsibilities in the relationship. You need to start with yourself. What, what are my choices of denial? That's where we need to begin. Mm -hmm. Most people who come to us and discuss the denial of their partner have actually more denial in themselves than their partner has within themselves. That's what we've noticed. And we find that very interesting, that, that the average person can't see themselves but thinks they can see their partner very clearly. Yeah. And, and that in itself is a form of denial. Mm -hmm. You're denying what's inside of you. The biggest problem here is not what's inside of your partner. It's inside of what's, insi inside of your, what's, what's inside of yourself yeah. and your denial of it. Yeah. Yeah. If you stop denying what's inside of yourself, your, you and your partner will automatically begin having a better relationship because your partner doesn't have to address a whole heap of issues and problems and deal with a whole heap of emotional shutdown and everything that they had to deal with before because you're taking far more responsibility for your life than you ever have. Mm. And that's going to help your relationship. It is. And I feel that the truth is an attractive quality. Mm. It just is. And from my own experience, having you as my partner who really values truth and desperately avoids denial, mm -hmm. Uh, you didn't force that upon me, but it was a very attractive, I think that's something that I've said to you from the beginning, mm. that, that it's very attractive to have someone in your life facing personal truth all of the time, mm -hmm. and it inspires the partner to do the, same. to do the same thing. So if your partner isn't inspired to get out of denial themselves, my suggestion is it's probably highly likely that you yourself are not out of denial either. Mm. And um, in the unlikely condition that your partner is avoiding, is in denial, but you are not avoiding, you know, you're out of denial, then you need to decide uh, and make some serious decisions about you and take action about your relationship. Because at the end of the day, your relationship cannot improve beyond what it is without both parties being out of denial. Mm. Yep. Great. <laughs> How does arrogance ruin my relationship? Well, again, I feel we need to first look at the purpose of arrogance. Well, why does a person want to be arrogant? Mm. Well, I think it's pretty clear why they want to be arrogant <laughs> in most cases. But, <laughs> but I think a lot of people don't give that much thought, uh, unfortunately, as to why they want to choose to be arrogant. What, what's their justification, their internal motivations yeah. for being arrogant in comparison to being humble? Mm. And, and if they knew that, then they probably wouldn't do it as much it, just by having that awareness of their own arrogance or the, the reasons why they choose arrogance. Mm. Uh, arrogance has many underlying motivations, which we'll yes. probably want to list a few of yeah. them now. So what if you list them and I'll discuss them? Sure. <laughs> so the first thing is if I'm the arrogant party in the relationship, mm -hmm. I generally want to control or manipulate you as my partner. Correct. So, so arrogance has the effect of controlling and manipulating our partner. Now, why would we want to control and manipulate our partner? If we loved them, we probably wouldn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So there must be some unloving reason why we wish to control and manipulate them. And a lot of the times it's because we want them to do what we want. Mm 
<laughs> so we're basically just being selfish in the relationship and there's a whole heap of things we demand and expect our partner to do and the way that we get our partner to do them is by just being arrogant with our partner and bossing them around all the time. <laughs> <laughs> bossing them around and forcing them into an acceptance of our opinion about matters. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So we just argue and argue and argue and argue until they, they admit we're right. One, one, one joke going around with men is, you know, if you have an argument with your, right, with your wife, the best way to, you know, stop the argument is just to admit she's right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is sad, isn't it? Which is very sad. Yeah. What if she's wrong? Yeah. From God's perspective, it matters whether she's right or wrong. Yeah. And, and you can't grow your relationship if she's wrong. Yeah. So you accepting something that's wrong, well, yeah, that's wrong yeah. <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, and that brings us probably to the second point, that if mm -hmm. in my partner relationship, you as my partner is arrogant towards me and I'm accepting that, mm -hmm. then that has some serious effects on our relationship as of, well, doesn't it? Of course, it? basically, I'm accepting manipulation and control. I'm accepting the desire of my partner to manipulate and control me. That means I have very, very little love of self. Mm -hmm. And if I've got very little love of self, how can I expect to have a growing relationship with my partner? Yeah. All that's happening is their love of self, and I wouldn't call it love of self, it's an abuse of self almost. Mm -hmm. Well, it is an abuse of self. But their so-called love of themselves, their arrogant opinion of themselves grows while my opinion of myself continues to degrade. And now, while one's growing and the other one's degrading, how, what's happening to the gap in between the two? Well, it's getting bigger, 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 bigger. That's what, you know, easily ruins a relationship. The bigger the gap, the more likelihood of the relationship being ruined. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about the purpose of arrogance is a way to control one's partner. Mm -hmm. The secondary thing is probably... About I don't know if it's secondary, darling. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. The it's, second thing. Yeah, the second thing. <laughs> Not secondary. Primary reason, really. It's probably yeah. the primary thing. Yeah. Because when we want someone to share our opinion, we often want to do that in order to feel superior to Correct. that person. Correct. So what we're doing is we want power and superiority over the other person. Now, that's a pretty evil emotion, actually. It's pretty dark. And we see that occurring in many relationships where one party wants power or complete feeling of superiority over the other. And sometimes you see it happening on different issues with different parts, of, you know. So the woman wants to feel that she's superior as a mother. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the man wants to feel that he's superior as the worker, you know, and you, and you have them both accepting their superiority over the other in the different avenues of their life. And that's so-called good relationship. Well, I don't think it's a very good relationship. What it is, is one person being superior to the other um, you know, and feeling superior to the other in certain cases and areas. And that's unloving, mm -hmm. no matter how you look at it. At the end of the day, both of you have similar capacities. And while you may have various qualities it, it just, and that the other person doesn't have, it doesn't make you superior to them yeah. as a person. It doesn't make them inferior to you as a person. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you're worth less or worth more or valued less or valued more. And in fact, when we value something less or more or make it worth less or more, we're actually having an issue with regard to the superiority and inferiority and the, co the complexities that superiority and inferiority create in a relationship are quite large mm -hmm. and they cause huge gaps in the two halves ever coming together. It's a, it's a massive problem mm. and people who use, you mentioned arguing, but also uh, projections like condescension, dismissal of Bit their partner. Yep. And, and all of these things, they have a dual purpose. One is to make the person who's doing it to feel superior, but also the corresponding effect is that their partner feels very bad about themselves and that is the purpose of yes. that projection. And they want their partner to yep. feel bad about themselves, which is just very disturbing, it actually. Is. It how, is. how can you say you love somebody when you want them to feel worse about themselves than they already feel? Yep. Like that, that's, not, that's not love. And that doesn't mean that you inaccurately say things about your partner to, in order to make them feel better. So if your partner comes up and says, do I have a fat bottom? <laughs> and you say no, when they do, that's not going to help them either. That's right? denial. That's we denial. talked about that in the <laughs> We previous. talked about that in the first question. <laughs> yeah. no, so, but arrogance wouldn't, wouldn't go, you know, you got a fat bottom what, when the person's just size 10 or size 8 yeah, or something, yeah. you know, quite small yeah. uh, in terms of their size. 
and you're trying to make them manipulate them into doing something even further yeah right to yeah. get their what you what you feel is the ideal they mm -hmm. should be mm -hmm. to be there yeah. and you know that's manipulation which is the one of the primary reasons why we revert to arrogance yeah. trying to manipulate our partner to do what we want because mm -hmm. we think that it's important so basically we've said that the purpose of uh of arrogance in a relationship is to manipulate and control a partner to get feelings of superiority and uh, have our partner feel inferior, inferior. and to have, to have power over our partner. and to have power that's very important so these are mm. the purposes of arrogance, arrogance within a relationship yes and okay. arrogance avoids anger which is interesting Arrogance is driven by anger most of the time, but it avoids anger by going, I'm above the anger. Yeah. Right? Oh, you know, you're just a silly idiot. Yeah. You, you're, so, you're so much of a silly idiot that I don't even have to get angry about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge tool, isn't it? Like yeah. you said. And this <clears throat> condescension is, is a very strong form of arrogance. And we see people employ that a lot with their partner. Well, they employ the it with their in general, general. world in general and with us most of the time. So, of yeah. course, they're going to employ it with their partner. Yeah. But it's a terrible addiction to stay in a state of arrogance. It has a terrible effect on your relationship uh, for, for many reasons, which we'll go into. Yeah. Um, so that in that way, it's about avoiding truth. So we've mentioned control, manipulation, power, superiority and avoidance of truth. Yes. This is all the reasons why there's arrogance in one or both of us in a relationship. Yes, and usually what we observe is that both parties have a degree of arrogance where they hold on to their own opinions quite strongly. They do not accept God's opinion about mm -hmm. any matter mm -hmm. and uh, they hold on to their own opinions quite strongly. The more they agree with each other, the better they feel their relationship is and the less they agree, the worse they feel their relationship is. And when they don't agree at all, they break up. <laughs> <laughs> not understanding that actually a lot of disagreement comes from both of you being in the wrong condition and not actually accepting God's viewpoint on the matter. And this is a big problem with arrogance is that it, is that it makes us completely blocked, not only to our partner's opinion and feelings, but completely blocked to God's opinion and feelings, mm. which if we're ever going to become at one with God is going to be a huge problem. But if we're ever going to become at one with our partner, it's also a huge problem. Yeah. Yeah, ironically, if, and, and as you would expect, I suppose, all of the issues that we have with our partner, we also have with God. Mm. So, so that's why working through your relationship issues can help you greatly with your relationship with God. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So you've already mentioned really the effect that this has is very divisive on, mm. the, on the relationship. It pulls the, the two parties end up feeling more and more distant from each other. It also creates a lot of anger and resentment, huge amounts of anger and resentment in the long run. Yeah. And, and people have resorted in the past to violence in their relationship because of the anger and resentment created by arrogance. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a terrible underlying cause of you know, the effect being the violence yeah. of an, it's an underlying cause of violence in relationships. And often we see uh, partnerships where the male is quite arrogant towards a female and she ends up feeling worse and worse about herself, shutting down sexually, which is something that the partner often wants from... So he attacks her more. So he attacks her more, which makes her feel worse about herself, shuts herself down more. She feels more and more like she's a lesser being. So he starts calling her being. frigid. Yes, yeah, so he then <laughs> attacks her more. Yeah. And in the end, there's just... There's no connection. Obviously, the... the the woman in that situation is not feeling how she feels as a result of the projection. No, if she did, she probably wouldn't, she wouldn't be there probably. Yeah, yeah. The same we see, don't we, with women with men, yeah. where the women think they're superior beings because they're mothers. Mm -hmm. They feel they're superior beings and they, they should have the say in the, final, in the household. They feel the men should look after their, uh, their fear, you know, so the men's, man's job is to, to make their fear go away and so forth. And so the women believe themselves to be superior beings. And, you know, the men go off and almost do anything, but as long as he treats her like he, she's a superior being, then, then everything's fine. Yeah. And we've noticed in some countries, you know, particularly when we're in Brazil, that the women are okay with their husbands going off and cheating on them even, as long as they still believe, the husbands <laughs> is this, still believe that the wife is the superior being. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> but she's the only one with brains and practicality and, you know, capability. And as and long as she's a he... mother and she's got the right to say what goes on with her children and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the reality is we see this superior superiority demonstrated by both genders in relationships. Yeah. And sometimes even in the same relationship, both genders develop, develop a sense of superiority one over the other in different areas of the relationship. Yeah. But in every single area they do it, you're creating a break, a fission, a, a gap between you and the other half of you. Mm -hmm. And that, that is always going to end up in disaster. It's a bad habit that it causes major disaster, ruin. Right. to your relationship yeah yeah so if we just quickly we've run through some of the secondary points about arrogance mm. um, and the effect it has on a relationship we've covered a lot there yeah but um, arrogance is obviously a lack of humility of course yeah so in the last session that we had we talked about the importance of humility in a relationship if you're ever going to grow a relationship whether that relationship be between yourself and god or yourself and your partner and in this case, arrogance is a, is a major break of, that, of the concept of humility and therefore and a major opposition to the concept of humility. So at the end of the day, you're not being humble. And if you're not being humble, you're never going to have a good relationship. Yeah. It's also a lack of desire for truth. Yes, because we're basically saying you know, that I know all truth. When I'm arrogant, I'm believing I know all truth. What a stupid position. Yeah. God knows all truth and you know barely any at all. And to be honest, if you're in your first incarnation on earth, you pretty much know nothing. And if you're in, even in your second incarnation on earth, which is only a few people in, there's still quite a lot you don't know. <laughs> so, so, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to get away from, from the concept of you knowing anything. And as we talked to uh, one couple recently in one of our feedback sessions, you need to give up your own opinions of yourself and your own opinions of what is right and wrong and accept God's opinions of yourself and God's opinions of what is right and wrong. That is really the only way that you can give up arrogance. And that's a state of humility. So that's it. And accepting God's truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Arrogance involves a desire to feel and believe oneself to be superior, which we've, we've talked about that. Yes, it's a terrible thing though, isn't it? Yeah. When it's felt, like yeah. if you allow yourself to feel that the other person believes themselves to be superior to you, it really feels like a very strong put down of yourself, doesn't it? They're yeah. not valuing you, yeah. they don't honour you, they don't respect you, they believe themselves to be better than you. There's so many negative emotions coming out of a person in regard to arrogance that, that and then that arrogant person believes that they should have a good relationship with you even and it's impossible mm -hmm. you can't have a good relationship with a person who believes themselves to be superior with you and and to you and and the real thing is why would anybody want to have a relationship with someone they believe is inferior to them anyway that's only because they want power yeah it's got no there's no other reason yeah like why would you want a relationship with a person who's not your equal? Yeah. And I do hear a lot of um, older ladies who have been attracted to divine truth thus far who, who speak in very kind of condescending, dismissive terms about their long-term husbands. And this is, I don't know And how, men generally. And men generally. And, and we noticed it even at the group, at the yes. assistance group we did in Australia, when, the when there'd yeah. be one man and a group of women and all of those women being condescending to one man. Like, and if I was that one man sitting there, I said, you're just a bunch of condescending <laughs> bitches, aren't you, really? <laughs> like, like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> but, you know, because the man would put up with it because yeah. he thinks he has to because that's what he's put up with from his mother all of his life. He accepted it from them too. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's sad. It's very, very sad. difficult for a person to feel attracted to their partner if the, the overwhelming message coming from that partner to to the person is that they're, they're inferior, that their will is not valid, that any, all mm. the, they're not really valid is yeah. really the projection that arrogance gives. Yeah. yeah. And it's sad because it, it, it hurts the person on the receiving end quite significantly if they have an emotional injury. And most of the time they do have the emotional injury to accept the hurt because otherwise they wouldn't be living with the person in the first place. Yeah. And it continues to hurt them in the same way that their own parents have hurt them. And uh, it's a really also, unfortunately, then becomes like more like a parent-child relationship than a relationship of equals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last point, which I know both of us feel 
very strongly about. And we've talked about how arrogance is a desire for power. Mm. When the truth from God's perspective is that in any relationship, there's a power in any loving relationship, there's a power vacuum. Yes. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because <coughs> I know it's a favourite topic for us. Yeah, um, by power vacuum, what we're basically saying is that there's no party in a good relationship who desires to take power and control over the other party. And if, if and obviously that you, you could feel that that would be a, love, a, ter- a tremendously good relationship with yeah. it when, when nobody's trying to manipulate you, no one's trying to control you, no one's trying to force you into doing what they want, no one's trying to take control of you, and you're not doing the same to them either. You're, you're in this loving space in that place. And, and this whole concept of a power vacuum, unfortunately, is very rare in relationships. And in fact, most relationships do have one person in power, mm-hmm. whether that be the husband or the wife. There is one person generally in power. Or we see this thing where people are in competition co- continually with each other, trying... Trying to get power. To get power. Yes. And, wanting they, and they might have established it in one area, but then the other one wants it in another area and, and all of this kind of competing, point scoring, feeling superior because I know about this but Those relationships generally don't last as long no. unless there's a huge amount of emotional denial. Yeah. Um, because usually what happens in those relationships is over time they become so distressed, each party becomes so distressed about the constant fighting and arguments and a constant competition for power that they eventually give up and try mm-hmm. and go and find a person who they can have power over. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's usually the result of those kind of relationships. I have though seen in religious circles in particular, relationships like that last the entire time on earth. And when you look at the sadness of that, like they might have been married in their 20s and they're 70 years of age, still engaged in this constant attacking, belittling process, you know, it, how, how hardened must you be at that point to any emotional sensitivity yeah. to, to stay in a relationship like that for 50 or 60 years? Yeah. But, but you see it a lot in religion, mm-hmm. where couples in religion feeling they have to stay together because they're now married and they treat each other so unlovingly and, and badly that by the time they arrive in the spirit world, both of them are in the hells of the spirit world and wondering why they're there. Mm-hmm. And it mostly is because they've just treated their partner so badly their entire life. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm. arrogance, something yes. to avoid. <laughs> so yes, ruination. It brings a ruination <laughs> to your <laughs> partner relationship. Well, and it's, as you meant in our introduction, it's one of these very evil It emotions. is an evil emotion, um, often motivated by some pretty evil underlying desires. And unless we eradicate them, they're not, we're not judging them from those. We're just stating that evil is something that is, that, that is completely in opposition to love. And while you have those kind of evil desires, it's highly unlikely you will ever have a loving relationship your entire life. Mm. And, uh, and if you do have what you consider to be a, a loving relationship, it's probably because you have almost total control and domination over the other. Um, which God considers is a very, very bad relationship, actually. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a terrible quality to develop. Obviously, again, developed in childhood, most of the time by parents who have taught their children that they are better than other people, mm-hmm. or taught children that their family is better than other families, or taught children that they are personally superior to others. And this uh, underlying childhood emotion is very, very difficult to eradicate and often has a terrible negative effect on relationships. Yeah. Mm. Okay. How does anger ruin my relationship? <laughs> well, this one to most people should be pretty obvious, I, uh, I would think. But, but if it was so obvious, you'd wonder why so many people still <laughs> tend to display anger so much in yeah. a relationship. Um, let's again look at the underlying reasons why we revert to anger. Yeah. And there's quite a lot of them, actually. And, and, and with all of these reasons that we're giving, they're not exhaustive lists. You know, they're, they're, they're quite small lists, yeah. uh, just that we want to dedicate to the topic at this point. Um, and anger, you know, there is a quite a long re- list of reasons why we may wish to engage in anger. But there's some primary underlying reasons 
why anger, we think anger is an effective tool mm -hmm. in our relationship. Yeah. So let's go through some of them. Okay. First one, anger helps me to feel powerful and in control of my partner rather than just feeling my own feelings and emotions. Correct. So power and control again. Another problem similar to arrogance, but yes. here we're reverting to actually a violent response, emotional response, anger, in order to gain power and control. It's usually usually done because something's got out of control in our mm -hmm. in our opinion, and we want to regain the control that we had, mm -hmm. right? And that's the reason why we revert to the anger. So basically, it's a terrible uh, indictment on our feeling of the other person's will because we want control of their will and, uh, and, and therefore demonstrate, should demonstrate to us that we have not learnt anything yet about free will and its use. Um, but it's, uh, uh, when, it, when it's used in such a way, it's basically used to regain control. You know, control has been lost, mm -hmm. in our opinion, and we wish to regain control yeah. back to how, what we believe you know, how we believe the relationship should be. Yeah. Okay, well, next one follows on from that. We use anger in order to have our partner meet our, ex our addictions and demands. Yes, and usually, again, this is about regaining their, you know, meeting our expectations and demands. So, in other words, we have a lot of expectations and demands that we're constantly putting on our partner. When they meet most of them, we're very, very happy, <laughs> we think. Yeah, <laughs> it would be the best way to put it, because actually our soul is getting destroyed further while it's happening. So our condition is degrading, but we think we're happy. But as soon as our partner stops meeting one of those additions or demands, we're very, very unhappy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to get them to go back to meeting the, the expectation or demand, we project a lot of anger and rage on them to manoeuvre them back into a place where they will feed our addiction again. Yep. Yep. And if we're using anger, it's, it's not subtle. We're trying to force them, aren't we? Correct. Yeah. We're trying to force them. Passive aggressive anger, by the way, is exactly the same as aggressive anger. Passive aggression is also a method of punishment and resentment. And it's also a method of you, we use to force the person back into control. Mm -hmm. So passive aggression is things like, I'm not having sex with you for a week because you did this or that. Or I'm not going to cook for you because you did this and that. Or I'm not going to go to work for you because you did this and that. Or I'm going to go out with my mates and party uh, for the next three weeks because you did this and that. You know, these are all passive aggressive ways of managing our desire to get the person back into control. Yeah. And that's just as bad as an aggressive way. Yeah. To do the same thing. Yeah. We also use anger in the context of a relationship simply to deny our fear and to make our partner feel responsible for our fears. Yes, yeah, so a lot of times anger comes up when we're afraid. So so you know, fear is the major trigger for anger. And and because of that, we're now getting angry because we really in denial, are in denial of a fear that something oh that has occurred in our environment. Which fear, by the way, God is trying to expose and release through the laws that God has, but which fear we are also in complete, usually, denial of, or definitely in emotional denial of. Mm -hmm. And so we try to avoid it, and we avoid the feeling and the experience of it. And whenever somebody triggers the fear, in other words, whenever somebody makes us feel that fear, or that fear rises within us again, it, it doesn't really matter who that person is that triggered it, we generally will blame the people closest to us that we can get away with dumping on for it. Yeah. And that usually is our partner. We can yeah. get away with a lot worse treatment generally with our partner than we can get with, away with with other people. And so what we generally do, no matter who triggers our fear, whether it be someone at work or someone, you know, the government or someone <laughs> else, even our children or anybody, we will normally want to revert to blaming our partner mm -hmm. for not mitigating this fear, not making it go away. Yeah. Or at least for them to be the outlet for, for our pent up anger, anger, lack of desire to feel our fear. Correct. We want an outlet. And very often we see people don't, we're using their relationship as really like their outlet for all the emotions they feel like they can't express outwardly to the world. Very sad. It's you very should be sad. treating your partner better yeah. than you treat anyone in the world. Although, 
you know, from God's perspective, you should be treating your partner the same mm -hmm. as what you treat anyone in the world. Um, but mo most people on earth would say, you know, at least I should be treated better than the same, more than the same. And the reality is most of the time we're treating our partner worse, worse. than we would treat anyone else. Yeah. And that's a shame. It is. Because it, it just creates gap between mm -hmm. us and our partner. The best, from God's perspective, the best way to treat our partner is equal to the way we treat anybody else, with the exception of a few areas. One of them is regarding the soulmate relationship with regard to sexuality, sexuality. And, and emotional closeness in the soulmate relationship, which would, which would only be with your partner. Mm. So, but aside from that, you would treat them equally with everyone else. And, uh, and if that's not happening, then already the partnership is in a state of breaking down yeah yeah okay a couple of other things we use anger for mm -hmm. simply to attempt uh sorry to attempt to avoid personal responsibility for yes. our our other feelings for emotion or yeah. even for what we should do yeah. or, or even for taking action yeah. you know a lot of times we project anger at a person because if we really felt about the issue, we'd have to leave them, or if we really felt about the issue, we'd have to do something else that we don't want to do. And so we get angry with them instead. So that, and it gets them to have to do the actions. They have to take all the actions. They have to do all the things that we didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the purpose of the anger, to have control over somebody, have power over them and get them to do what we want. And so, you know, a lot of the times we don't realize while we're projecting this kind of anger, we're, all we're doing is demonstrating our desire for power and control and our desire to manipulate and our desire to harm the other mm. person. And, and yeah, very sad, mm. very sad to see that happening in a relationship. It's very sad to see that happening in any relationship, let alone a partner relationship. Yeah, yeah. Okay, final thing. My anger prevents me from being emotionally open. So I might use anger in a relationship simply to avoid emotional intimacy with my partner. Yes. And this is the irony of anger, is that anger destroys emotional openness and sensitivity for both parties, actually. So anger isn't the feeling of emotion, actually, mm -hmm. not in the way that will heal you. Yeah. Anger is the expression of emotion to harm others which is a completely different state than actually working through the experience of your emotion. Now, the appropriate way to deal with anger is to go out and bash something or, you know, to go out and yell and scream if you're really, really frustrated in the relationship. That's the appropriate way to deal with your anger. If you do that, you will eventually find the underlying emotion that you're avoiding. The sadness or the fear that is being triggered or the sense of inferiority or worthlessness that's being triggered by whatever has happened will be triggered and you'll start to feel it and you'll let yourself release it. But while you remain angry in, a, in your relationship and project that anger and blame on others, it's highly unlikely you'll choose to take a more responsible action with your anger. Yeah. So can I clarify though, because I feel that I've had this experience about anger simply being used as a tool to prevent emotional intimacy. Yep. So there might not be any other purpose other than, oh, we're getting closer and I feel um, frightened. Correct. I don't want to feel that, so I'm just going to be globally angry yes. because I, I don't want to feel that fear. Yes, it's a tool to avoid your fear, the yep. fear in this case of intimacy. Yeah. And, and many people in relationships want their relationship to be this close. They don't want it to be this close, wider, and they don't want it to be this close, close as to be touching each other. Yeah. They want it to be this close permanently. Yeah. So when one party goes a bit closer than that, they get angry straight away. Yeah. But when that party goes further away than their, what they would desire, they also get angry. Yeah. Either one makes them angry, right? Yeah. They get angry when they have emotional distance and they get angry when there's more emotional closeness because what they want is only a certain gap. Mm -hmm. They want a certain level of control over the relationship. They don't want to fully give their heart to the relationship and they don't want the other person getting them into a state where they have given themselves fully to the relationship. And so what they do is maintain a gap yeah. and the gap can't be too big and it can't be too small. Yeah. It has to be exactly that gap. Yeah. 
And a lot of anger in relationships is caused by people wanting to maintain a specific gap in their relationship between mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we've said. Which, remember, was our problem, wasn't it? it like definitely. Try, every time I'd get closer, you'd be further away. Yeah, every yeah. time I move a bit further away, because you now want to be further away, you'd want me to be closer. <laughs> Absolutely. And I couldn't even really tell you what I was angry about. I was just angry yeah. because I, I You weren't was... getting the gap maintained. Yep. Yeah. And, and instead, there was a triggering of loneliness and everything when I go further away, or a trigger of emotional and sexual intimacy when I'm closer yeah and which, you don't want either yes and so you just maintain a gap yeah and that way you don't have to feel the loneliness that from the relationship breakdown and you don't have to feel the terribly uh, overpowering emotions of emotional intimacy and sexual intimacy yeah. and so you get to maintain the gap yeah mm. exactly it's a big issue mm. so we've said basically anger is a method to try to control our partner mm -hmm. it's um attempt to force our partner to use their will to meet some of our addictions or demands mm -hmm. it's uh used in denial of fear and it's used in denial of personal responsibility for whatever emotion is coming up it might mm. not just be fear and if we look at each of those things that it causes, mm -hmm. you can see that, yeah, if you're going to stay in that place, then your relationship's going to get ruined, for yeah. sure. Yeah. It's, going to, it's, it's a terribly bad habit to keep, on, to keep on staying enraged or in resentment with your partner and then expect your relationship to improve because it will not improve. Yeah. It cannot improve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about some specific additional things about anger mm -hmm. and how, the impact that has on a partner relationship. So, anger causes me to take out my past hurt on my partner or myself. Now, this is a, a good point, I feel. Mm, yeah, it basically, a lot of our anger comes from our addictions not being met. And our addictions are all about um, unfelt uh, emotion from our childhood of hurt mm -hmm. that we want somebody else to make go away by feeding our addiction. And, and so what we finish up doing is projecting our belief systems and our addictions onto our partner. And, and so a lot of the times we're angry with our partner for things they haven't even personally done. Yeah. What, who's done them is usually our parents our, and opposite, on, a lot of the time our same gender parent <clears throat> it would have inculcated these particular emotions into us and our opposite gender parent would have done things to us. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, we have the same, same viewpoints as our parents have about the gender that we're living with. Yeah. And, uh, and as a result, we have a tendency to blame them for all of the unhealed stuff that happened in our childhood. Yeah. Very yeah. sad, really. Very sad. Mm. And um, we've mentioned there that anger causes me to take out that past hurt either on my partner or on myself. And again, I can see where this is something where... I've, I've exerted a lot of anger towards myself as well, and that's mm. had a very detrimental effect on our relationship in yes. the past. So in the extreme, uh, when you take out your hurt on yourself, you'll start to abuse substances, alcohol, drugs, in order to you know, mask the pain you feel about yourself. Mm -hmm. In the less extreme, you'll, you'll always be putting yourself down, be pessimistic, never, never really taking charge of your life and unfortunately that places huge demands emotionally on your partner yeah because then they have to take com command of your life take control that's what you're trying to force them into doing to prove their love of you yeah and uh, and, and it's a terribly demanding thing to do to your partner and whenever they don't do that you get angry with them yeah and that, yeah. that's also very sad yeah. yeah yeah okay all right anger can cause me to believe that my partner is the same as all of the other people who are the same gender as my, as partner. my partner. Correct. So we generalise and blame and... Yep. So, so we notice a man down the street, you know, he was treating his wife bad, so we come home and yell at her husband. Because <laughs> <laughs> we think that he's going to do the same thing at some point in the future and he needs to be just kept in line. <laughs> it's also a bit deeper than that, isn't it? Oh, if course. we've been harmed by our... So the, the same gender as our partner in our childhood, then obviously when we're angry, we're just going to generalise that onto 
our partner who yes. is of the same gender. Yes, unfortunately, this is why our, our partnership often turns into be the worst relationship we have yeah. because we're projecting the most negative emotions towards our partner than we, end, uh, than we are towards any person. Yeah. And that's, that's yeah. sad that, you know, we start out wanting to have closeness and intimacy and end up with destroying closeness and Im intimacy because we treat our partner worse than we treat anybody else. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, because we're generalising. The next way it happens is that we hold on to resentment about past issues in the relationship. Or so, in past relationships. Or from frequent, past relationships. Or yeah. from our childhood. Resentment is such a powerful emotion. It, it's worse than anger. Anger is the instant response of, you know, rage towards a particular situation. Resentment is the build-up of resentment and hatred over long periods of time of having suppressed anger. And resentment is a very, very destructive emotion upon our soul and also upon our relationship. Destructive because it, it will cause us in the long run to do very significantly evil things if we are not careful. Mm -hmm. And this is resentment is, is caused by not feeling anger when it arises and suppressing it each time it arises. And in the end, you get a build up of this anger and anger. And it turns into this seething resentment that we notice in many relationships where and, and, and the sad thing about seething resentment is that, is that it causes you then to make some very, very bad and evil decisions mm -hmm. with regard to your par partner mm -hmm. and uh, and also in regard to your children unfortunately and it can cause a lot of personal soul damage yep. to to yourself and many people who arrive and there are billions of people who arrive in the spirit world in seething resentment and hatred and it takes many of them many years to overcome because they need to go through every single thing that they got angry about. Mm. Mm -hmm. My suggestion is start doing that now. by choice now, yeah. Yeah. rather than having more and more seething resentment build up, yep. causing the complete destruction of all of your relationships. Yeah, mm. yeah. So there you're really talking <coughs> about anger as a form of punishment. And obviously, when we're punishing our partner, we're very far from the state of loving them, aren't we? Yeah, once we get into the state of punishing, uh, using anger to punish, we're really already in a lot of resentment. And, uh, and there's already now a state of hatred being developed. And punishment is the desire to not just pull somebody back in line, but to make that person feel really bad about what they've done yeah. in the past. And you don't resolve problems in a relationship by trying to force the other person into feeling bad about what they've done. That being said, a relationship can't improve if the party who's done something bad isn't repentant. So, so while repentance is a requirement to have a good relationship, forcing repentance is never possible. It has to be a voluntary action mm -hmm. on the part of the person who's done something wrong. And whenever you use resentment to punish a person, you're actually creating more problems rather than less in the relationship. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay. So there's quite a lot caused by anger, and yeah. you can see that every one of those things would definitely has the potential to completely destroy a relationship. Mm -hmm. So rather than choosing anger, we're better off learning how to proper, properly feel anger, which is a lot about taking responsibility for the anger and in, more importantly, taking responsibility for the emotion underneath that causes the anger, whether that be fear or a feeling of superiority or expectation or demand. We need to feel those emotions if we're ever going to cure our own anger and therefore you know, build the relationship rather than destroy it. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. All good? Thumbs up. Uncle. Yeah, with anger, we just want to add to the anger issue that anger is a, is a major cause of violence. Mm. So oftentimes relationships resort to violence because of the build up of anger and resentment. So obviously it's going to cause a lot of problems in the, in the relationship and, and, uh, and historically has even caused many relationships to resort to such violent means that they kill the other party. Mm. So, you know, it's definitely a quality that needs 
to be eradicated from our life if we're ever going to have a good relationship.